So welcome back. Thanks for coming. Thanks for joining us. Fun fact, I mean, it's fun for me. Um, our next speaker comes from Ukraine. And for those who don't speak any Slavic languages, Ukraine, in Polish anyway, it means round the corner. So basically not far off. So uh, the speaker is Sergi Kostyshin, and Sergi specializes in data processing, microservices, and clean, robust architectures. As a software engineer and project manager, he has contributed to development efforts by various companies. He's also helped Silicon Valley startups launch the first innovative services and also took part in the evolution of market-leading products by global tech heavyweights. Ladies and gentlemen, let's warmly welcome the life cycle of an A-B test and Sergi Kostyshin. Hi, everyone. Do have, yeah. Uh, so we are going to go through a life cycle, a single realistic A-B test. And we'll start with a small question. Does everyone know what an A-B test is? Who knows what an A-B test is? Okay, who has used them? Who does not know what it is? Okay, so uh, a quick recap is in order. An A-B test is uh, a technique that is used in, in user-facing applications, user-facing uh, systems. And the idea is that we do not really know, we can't predict users' reactions to whatever we roll out to them. So we just run an experiment. So let us say we do not know. This is a kind of a realistic but frequently cited, frequently trivialized example. We, uh, we do not know if we should make a buy button, the main button, red or green. So we roll out two versions, show it to 50% users, and see which of, that of them gets clicked more on. And whatever wins, we ship to production. So this is essentially an A-B test, but let me uh, go through something uh, slightly more interesting. Let us say this is my bicycle, and uh, I don't use it anymore. I would like to sell it. How do I sell it? Obviously, I go online. I look for a website that sells used stuff. And depending on your country, it could be Amazon, it could be uh, Allegro, it could be Olex, it could be Alibaba, but let's say that all of you are members of a development team of a startup that uh, rolls out a competitor to these websites. And let's call it with a trendy name, Cell AI, for example. Uh, just to be clear, this is a fictional company, but the example will be realistic. So let us say I'm going to, I would like to sell this bike. I go on this website, I see a button, sell your stuff. I click on it, I land on this form. Obviously, for to post any kind of advertisement, I first needs, need to register. So first name, last name, whatever. I click submit, I get to another form. It says, what would you like to sell? Name, category, price, photos, whatever. When I click submit on that one, then, uh, in marketing terms, it's, it is said that I have converted. So I have landed on the website and I have done what I was supposed to do. I have registered, I have posted my advertisement. And if you look at, at the behavior of users at each of the stages, so if we take the total number of users who land on this form as 100%, then only small fraction of it, relatively small fraction, this, this is what you will often see in realistic application, will submit the first form. And out of them, smaller fraction would submit the second form. The, the percentage in the end, this 13.8, is called the conversion rate. And let us say that your task right now is to increase this conversion rate. Because out of 100 users that land on this form, only 14 end up submitting their, uh, their thing for sale. So let's improve it. Here's our goal. So if you look at this form and think about how do you improve it, uh, then if you look, long, look at it long, long enough, you will uh, probably think that only one of these two forms are interesting to, to me as a user who wants to sell something. And this is this form, right? 
I didn't come here to create yet another account to, to share my phone number, address, whatever. I came to sell. So the idea you might, you might have, the hypothesis would be, is that you could switch those two forms like this. So that you put first the information that is relevant to me, and then after I click submit, the hypothesis is that pure psychology comes into place. I have already done some work. I have invested some effort into posting some information. So your hypothesis would be that I'm less likely to drop off to abandon this whole process at this step when I see the sign up form. Right? This might, may or may not be true, but this is what A-B testing is for. We have a hypothesis, we like to test it. Uh, now what? What do we do now? So we have two variants that we want to test on real users. Do we go straight to coding? No. Let me remind you or tell you that A-B test is actually an experiment, a scientific experiment. Why? Because what we're essentially trying to do is we have this small test sample. So we are going to test it like for a couple of days or, or a week to on whatever number of users come to, to us. And we want to predict, based on that information, the behavior of the entire population of users that will come to us next month, next year, next 10 years. You can imagine that this task does not have a one correct solution. We can only talk in terms of probabilities. Uh, let's say that with 95% probability, we are right. And to do that, that, so that sounds exactly like the uh, experimentation techniques that are used in science. And this is why that's the right tool to apply for it. And this is why to do A-B test, not just intuitively, but to be able to say confidently that it's not just not some numbers showed it, but that with some probability we can predict that the, the all the users will behave this way and not the other. We have a so-called experiment plan. And if your company, the Cell AI, has been in business for some time, you will probably have a template. Uh, let's just quickly fill it out. Uh, variants. So we will have two variants, the baseline, the original order of forms and the treatment with the swapped order of forms, and we are going to show it to 50% of our users who land on that form at random. Enough for this item. Target metric. As we have said, we would like to improve the conversion rate, and our current value is 13.8%. This is needed for later calculations. Now, target metric change. This is a very important one, and it is tricky because it's not what we hope it to be, but it is the smallest percentage of change that we want to be able to detect with a given certainty. Uh, for example, if we want to detect that with a given certainty, like for sure that uh, the conversion rate has increased by a factor of two, by 100%, we don't need to do m many tests, right? We we can run a couple of thousand, maybe a couple of hundred, and we'll be able to tell right away if it's go. If it does it look like two times, or it does it more like 1.1 time? So the lower this difference percentage, the more tests you will need to run. So there is a some kind of s you will have to find the same balance in it. Uh, there should also be some guardrail metrics. Uh, you know, for example. Whenever you register, you will always get a fraction of people who have first name AAA, last name BBB, and so on. Uh, we, by introducing this change, we just want to make sure that we do not get make those things worse. We do not incentivize people in whatever way to to behave like that to to submit fake data. And so, invalid profiles, invalid ads, uh, the total revenue you can get, we can get them. These are the things that we can monitor throughout the experiment to see if, if not, we are not just looking at the conversion rate, we are also looking at the big picture that we do not miss anything important there. Expected audience size, uh, this, is, this depends on your website. Let's say that 5,000 people land on the first page on our website a day. So that's, that's a given. Now, based on all this information, we calculate two key things. 
The first is the sample size per variant. How many users should see each variant so that we can say with the uh, with these parameters, p less than 500 and power equals to 1.8, which is separate size, I will not cover it here, uh, that the experiment has shown a given result, more than 5%. And if that many people need to show it, to see it, then we should run the experiment, just simple division, for at least 16 days. Now we are ready to actually get coding. So we implement this in code, we launch it, and we pray. But actually, since we are running a scientific experiment, uh, we might instead just wait watchfully for this 16 days or maybe slightly more to see what the results are. Let's say the results are in, and this is our original data, and the results are like this. It looks like it worked. So much more people are submitting the first form now that the first form is more relevant to them. And the, apparently there is some psychology at work. So instead of 13.8, we have 15.8% of conversion rate, which is plus 15%. Uh, is it a lot or not? Do you think it's a good result or not? Not really? Uh, let me put it differently. So. Uh, Presumably, we earn money from people selling something through our platform, right? So by running this experiment, we have got 15% more people submitting their things on our platform. And presuming that our revenue is proportional to the number of items on our platform, it means that we got a 15% increase in our revenue by just swapping two forms. This is not simply good, it's too good to be true. If we get five results like this, five successive experiments like this, we would have doubled our revenue. Just to give a sense of proportion of what we are looking at. Now, the experiment has been a success. The next step in the life cycle of the experiment would be to close the experiment by shipping the variant. We know it's better, so we ship the variant to 100%. And then we document it, we share it with other members of our organization to, to, to make sure that we have some organizational knowledge. And what we do next, run more experiments. You've seen that this form has been, uh, I would say, pretty primitive. We can spice it up, we can make it look better. Maybe, maybe it will invite more users to complete it. We can split the forms into, into further steps. It's a trick that works often. And uh, for example, we can use some machine learning. So you've entered the product name. Why do not we try to guess the product category based on it? OK, and a couple of words about the A-B testing strategy. So we you never run a single experiment. I like the metaphors. And let this be a metaphor. Uh, we are here. This is our conversion rate. We want to get there. So let us say 13.8 to 25%. How do we get there? You never get it by one experiment. If you did, you would be extremely lucky. More likely it's going to be like this. You run one, then a series of experiments that improve your metrics. But, of course, it's a very optimistic picture. In reality, to get five successful experiments, you will get maybe 20 of unsuccessful. And by unsuccessful, I mean experiments that fail to move the metric at all, or decrease the metric, or just move it in a completely different way to a dead end so you can need to roll back. And this is actually how a real world experiment, experimenting, A-B testing looks like. And this is why the uh, this simple approximation of, of green and red button buttons is uh, so primitive and uh, minimal because you never, practically, you never run a single experiment in isolation. You run a tree of experiments, a series of experiments to improve whatever metric you are targeting to improve. I hope this was enough to pique your interest in A-B testing and obviously this is an area that needs uh, requires much more knowledge and some specific uh, statistics knowledge in particular. So if you would like to talk more about it, I would be happy to meet you
somewhere in the corridors. Thank you. Thank you very much. Join me in thanking Sergi Kostishin.